Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. We're going to start off with some live lightning mapping here on uh, Monday evening. We're watching a pretty large complex of storms that were going through parts of the Red River Valley of the South. Storms stretched also down here along the Gulf Coast and into Florida. But here on the nose of an extended piece of the Pacific jet stream, we had some storms earlier today, accompanied with some very strong winds. We'll show you more about that in a second. Uh, but this website I like to use is called blitzertongue.org. Highly recommend uh, using this website, although I don't fully understand the advertisement over here on the left, but it's a great one for you to check out. Let's talk about those winds. The Pacific jet right now is really just screaming. It's very zonal through the Gulf of Alaska, where there's a deep trough right here around the Aleutian Islands. And it's just pumping all that momentum and quite a bit of moisture into the Pacific Northwest. And I'll show you the surface winds tomorrow in just a few moments. But I want to talk about the southern branch to this, the subtropical branch, which is cutting across the Baja. And it's got this very elongated jet streak on which we're getting some excellent upper level support right here in the form of some divergence coming out of the left exit of that jet. What that does is it just provides great upper level um, diver divergence. So the air is allowed to spread aloft, getting the air to rise rapidly into this area. And it's going to set us up on a multi-day severe weather event that's going to start tonight in Texas and Oklahoma and move east with time. But I'd like to come back and get a setup for the rest of this forecast video by talking a bit about snow. Because over the weekend, we talked about the systems that were coming through parts of the Midwest and the Northern Plains, which did put down some snow. You can see here, just looking back at the last 72 hours of snowfall, some places in Iowa, Northern Illinois, and throughout Wisconsin picked up some snow. Now, we did warm up after that, but this brings us to an important point about where we currently sit on the season. So let's blow this up and take a close look. Now, it is April the 4th. All right, but look at the water that is in the snowpack that's around Lake Superior and on the headwaters of the Mississippi. All right, but if you come back to the Missouri Basin, that is a region where throughout much of this winter we've not had much snow. In fact, I brought along a map to show you that. It's the percent of normal snowfall compared to the 2008 to 2021 average looking through uh, this point in the year, so through April 4th. Now, the data begin on September 30th. And this has been an area that has been in sizable deficit on snowfall this year. You can also talk a lot about the West. We've talked a lot about the Western drought, though, in recent videos. Another area right here in the Ohio River Valley and throughout New England. Those are all areas that have seen substantially less than normal snowfall. And as a result, when you look at the stats on the uh, year-to-date precipitation ranks, this is an area we've been talking a lot about. And the reason why I'm covering it now is there is some evidence with the pattern as it's about ready to shift to improve some snowpack in the mountains and possibly bring, be bringing in moisture to this area, moisture that is desperately needed. Throughout California, Southern Oregon, parts of the Snake River Valley, getting to Utah, Nevada, and Arizona, we are not going to be able to see the atmosphere develop a strong enough subtropical jet that gets far enough to the north to contribute moisture in this area in a significant way in the month of April. We'll take a look at that again in a few seconds as well. But this is what I think we're going to have to watch carefully. Let's look at the next 15 days, and I want to focus in on the jet stream pattern because right here is where that strong piece of the Pacific jet is. But as I've stated, this pattern is open. So see that wave moves in here Tuesday. We're going to talk about what it does. It would appear that it closes off, which means it's going to slow down. And behind it, a large ridge is building in the west. So the temperatures are really going to crank late this week. But nothing's keeping it around forever. See the trough continues to move. Now it's slow. Thursday to Saturday, it moves basically three states. It's going to take a while to get out, but it will get pushed. And this is the feature I'm very interested in seeing develop. This trough on the 10th, 11th, and 12th that digs into the west. When I look out here at this point, I see one, two, three, four, maybe five, possibly a sixth wave orbiting around the North Pole. It's a very high wave number pattern. High wave number patterns means lots of short waves. They can be amplified, but they're short, and they tend to move through the flow from west to east, meaning the pattern is unblocked. But I'm watching this one most carefully because it would appear that a system will likely eject into the high plains of Colorado or Wyoming, which could return moisture here. I'll show you in a few moments. Unfortunately, it does mean another round of severe weather. So we got this week a short break, and then next week we could go right back into it again. Now, bigger picture things that are moving around right now. So in other words, where do we take that going longer range? Let's talk about La Nina. It is still very much present. We had seen throughout March strong trade winds, but those trade winds have since begun to back off. 
We've already seen a warm-up happening over here in Nina Region 1 plus 2. And I'll be talking about in Thursday's video the significance of the cooler water here when we get the brand new long-range outlook from the ECMWF. But it's these trades I'd like to know about because you've heard me say so much throughout this winter and spring that I felt that the pattern was really being dominated by what's happening in the tropics. So here's the first part of this. I love these Hovmuller diagrams. Today, all the way through the 19th. Now notice this, those strong trade winds seem to want to last for about another eight days, and then we lose the signal. Now what that is, what that means is we might possibly start to now be seeing the spring winding down of the, um, of the La Nina, and it'll happen first in the winds, and then the ocean temperatures will respond. But you notice you get past about the 13th, and we lose this. Okay, now what does that mean? That means for the first time, I know this is kind of an ugly view of this, we might start to see real movement in the MJO. Remember, throughout so much of the second half of winter, it just wanted to spend time in the Indian Ocean. It couldn't break into, you know, phases five and six. Well, it's currently sitting right here in null space doing nothing. But it's expected. Now look, the European Ensemble has more of its ensemble members suggesting a phase six or possibly a phase seven or even moving over to phase eight transition. And I'm starting to buy into this. I've now seen enough evidence that I think that La Nina isn't going to give us another big kick of trade winds. I haven't yet found evidence for it. So what this means to me is we could possibly see this pattern. More frequent troughing in the northwest. Ridging at times that will extend from Texas all the way to New England, maybe into eastern Canada. But it's this trough I'm most interested in because as we see these troughs dig in, systems eject and keep a big section of the country very active with precipitation. But I think the models have underdone this a little bit. And this is what I'd like to, to say here. If we get the MJO into the Pacific Ocean finally, and we continue to see high momentum in the Pacific jet stream, then what you've got here in this forecast is too dry in this area. This is the new update for April 15 to May 15. And what I think we've got here in the model is it's too dry in this particular region. I do expect very tight planting windows for those that do early planting into this region, especially in the Mid-South. That's been our strongest signal on where it's going to stay the wettest as we go from uh, the month of April into the month of May. It won't be that we won't find windows. I just think they're going to be tight. I only agree with this with respect to what I see in California, which is unfortunate because the models continue to pick out that as being a, a drier feature. So this is it. This is what I'm, I'm getting honed in on as I think that we are a little bit too dry in this part of the Western Corn Belt. I think we're gonna see more active systems. So let's kind of get into the near term and see if we can make some better sense of this. Okay, today, this evening, about 625 when I'm recording, all of this is um, red flag warning here and here. This is all high wind watches and warnings. With the blues represent where we've got um, uh, we've got uh, winter weather advisories, and there's still winter storm warnings on the Cascades. So this system that's coming out here has got some wind, and there's major risk of fire danger out ahead of it. You can see all of this here. In fact, by tomorrow midday, this is what the surface winds are, are forecast to look like. We may have gusts between now and then all along the west and getting into the high plains that at times may be in the range of 30 to 60 plus miles an hour. I wouldn't be surprised to see a few of these approaching 70 plus miles an hour. And as a result of that great tool from the Storm Prediction Center here, this is their fire weather outlook. So this was their outlook for today on Monday when I'm recording. On Tuesday, you can see a large area in which they have a critical risk. And as you look out there, day three through eight, so this will be Wednesday through early next week, again, we're watching several regions in through here that could continue to see very high wildfire risk. Now, there's a severe weather side to this as well. And tonight, as we anticipated, this was the region we were going to see our strongest severe storms. By the time we get into tomorrow, whoops, sorry, let's kill my sound there. By the time we get into tomorrow, we're going to be watching the same area here from southern Mississippi into South Carolina. But that's all going to be from the first system that came across the Baja. Remember, there was a second one that's going to curl up into the Great Lakes, and it's going to bring its front through the southeast, including parts of Tennessee, but Alabama, Georgia, right along the Appalachian Mountains. It's going to be bringing that in on Wednesday. And on Thursday, that severe weather risk is going to translate east and be over parts of the Carolinas. 
So let's take a look at all these pieces and do a multi-model analysis here. I'm going to start you off with the 18Z NAM run. So as we play this forward, we can see the complex of storms moving through here. You can see the scattered but very heavy snow showers that are on the strong jet stream flow coming right over the top of the mountains west to east. What you're going to notice is two separate systems through the overnight tonight into Tuesday morning, Tuesday midday, and then Tuesday evening. Now you watch the southern cluster first. So this is tonight through the day tomorrow. It just pushes straight from the Red River Valley of the south right into the Carolinas and Virginia. So that's through tomorrow night. The second system is curling up here in the north. And what you notice about that one is it brings some snow into western Montana out of the Canadian Prairie. More snow on the Red River Valley of the north. And then as this system curls out, look at the strong front that it rips through parts of the Midwest here. This is going to come through overnight on Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. See it there? And then that's the front that's going to continue to push its way over toward the east, giving us the severe weather risk later in the week. Now the issue with this low is it becomes vertically stacked. That means the upper level low sits on top of the surface low, which slows the whole thing down. A lot of cold air comes in on the backside, so we might, I would not be surprised if we end up getting a blizzard warning out of this. Not on really heavy snow, but on the fact that you have the snow plus 35 plus mile an hour winds, and then the reduction in visibility. So we're gonna watch out for that on Thursday. Now to see where it goes from that point, we gotta flip over to our multi-model analysis with the GFS on the left and the European on the right. So let's play up to where we've already seen. There's into Tuesday midday, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, Let's just stop it right here on Thursday morning where we left off. Both models have the stacked low. See the snow on the backside. Storms moving through the east. Now that system is going to be a slow mover through Thursday, getting into Friday. If you are in the eastern Great Lakes region, the Ohio River Valley, it's in both models. This is just going to be a miserable into the week and weekend with temperatures, scattered precip. Not looking forward to that. I live in that area. But what's going to happen after this is that we're going to go into a, just a relatively calmer time period briefly over the weekend before the next trough digs into the west on the 11th and into the 12th. Now what happens at that time period is the GFS is less amplified than the European. The European places the high here, digs in the deep trough, it ejects into Colorado and Wyoming. That means we're going to open up another week with Monday night, into Tuesday morning, severe storms and heavy rain here. But remember me showing you earlier all those snow maps? This was the reason why. I've now seen several model runs from the European picking out this region as potentially having a, a significant snowfall event. And that's returning moisture to an area. I don't care that it's snow, to be honest with you. I just want to beat back the drought. So to see this in this area is, is a, such a positive thing. But if you have that high right there, it's going to just place a multi-day severe weather event to the south. Because just like you saw earlier, the upper level low becomes closed off and it just takes a long time to move. Ready? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So we see that. Sorry, at the end of that animation, I got a bad uh, data point in there. But that's what we're keeping an eye on. And it is in both models. So let's put it together and get, it, get an idea on this. These maps show the probability of getting another inch of rain over the next 10 days. So we've come back to that longer term story of having very limited windows to get field work done in the Mid-South, in the Southeast, through the Midwest, especially on the Eastern side of the Mississippi River. But this is new. To finally see colors on the map in that area is spectacular. From there, let's talk about snow. I'm gonna show you the operational run first. Let's blow it up one more time, there we go. So as we go through Tuesday into Wednesday, first system puts more snow here in the upper Midwest. As we then keep going here into Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Remember, this is when the second big system comes down. Watch the snow it puts down here in the Cascades in the Northern Rockies. And then remember, this one pops out right there by next um, Tuesday, Wednesday. Now, this is an operational run. So we see these big snowfall amounts knowing that we're looking way out in an operational run. So I'm looking for placement. I'm going to look for consistency. We'll get three different times to talk about this before it actually occurs. But the ensembles have picked up on it as well. This map shows you the probability of getting at least three inches of snow between now and 10 days from now out on the 14th of April. That This is an important map given where we currently have drought stress, which we talked about on Thursday. Now, where does it go fully into week two? Well, watch this deep trough. This is on Monday into Tuesday, 
Wednesday, and Thursday. See how it just slowly moves? Look, from Nevada to the Great Lakes takes almost four days to get there across the country. And it's going to sit here and just stay in this part of the country through the 17th, 18th, and 19th. And that flow pattern, which is still unblocked, keeps this deeper trough. And that's got me thinking about a lot of things. The moisture, first of all, which is what you see here, that's why in the week two we keep this area wet and we're talking about severe storms here. But it's also got me thinking a lot about what the temperatures are going to do. Now, I worked on this quickly this afternoon. It's an ugly map. But I wanted to know how many times after today, the 4th of April, there was a frost at these cities across the U.S. I actually have a database of 30,000 cities. I just plucked out some of them here. Now, let's zoom in and get a better look at this. South. When you see a number on a certain location, that tells you, for example, see the number 12 here? That 12 times in the last 40 years, there's been a frost after April the 4th. You come down here pretty far to the south, so Austin, San Antonio, it's, the numbers are small. What I'm concerned about is going later in this month that we could have another number added to this graph. That's what I'm seeing here. And in the southeast, again, same kind of look, look here. It's pretty common to still have frosts into the middle part of the month of April in northern Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. Uh, more than half the time sometimes in this area. But what I'm getting concerned about is how far to the south that frost is going to be. Now, this is just the next seven days. I saw that out there in week two as being a risk as well. Can't nail it down yet, but it's just a risk. So we see here that over the next seven days, we're going to hit all those areas except for southern Texas. We're going to hit these areas we talked about in this area. But let's talk about what these temperatures are going to do by looking at the highs compared to average. So this was today on Monday. Let's get to Tuesday. Major warm-up throughout Texas. That's the warm sector opening up ahead of this next system. That's Wednesday getting into Thursday. Now we have the deep upper level low here. It sits over where the Ohio and Mississippi come together while the Big Ridge builds west. Deep into the 90s, very mild throughout the west under the ridge, while the cold air just slowly exits on Saturday into Sunday east. But as we stated, the pattern's open, and this is now the 10th. That's when the next trough digs in. So we look out there day 5 through 10, the 12Z GFS says bring that deep trough in. That's going to open up this area next week to more severe weather, but it keeps moving. And this is that time period I'm getting focused on that's you know out there almost approaching the third week of April that I'm just going to have to keep an eye on a late frost risk farther to the south. Don't have details on it yet. Just going to have to keep an eye on this. All right? Okay, that gets North America out of the way. Let's finish up with a bit on South America and we'll finish this whole video. Last 30 days has been very dry here. This is from the CPC looking at a 30-day uh, precipitation uh, anomaly figure. So some places out in here missing out on several inches of precipitation. To the south, though, it's been extremely wet and we've had a mixed bag throughout Argentina. Over the next seven days, we continue to stay dry on much of that safrina crop. And it's been dry at a critical stage on it and extremely wet to the south. Some of the latest model runs midday today, though, are trying, as I use this one week sliding window here, to return better moisture back over that safrina crop once we get past this week into next week. I've still got question marks on this because it's all going to depend on the behavior of the MJO and also on the uh, La Nina. So I'm going to watch that all very carefully. But I'd like to do one last thing for you all here. Show you the weeklies, which just came out today. South America, 30-day anomaly. And let's do this. That's mid, I'll stop it right there, mid-April to mid-May. We need to know if we're going to encroach on Mato Grosso more dry conditions going forward. Because at this point, the weeklies do not paint a picture for any sort of negative impact going forward. It's right here that I'll keep a close eye on. I'll keep you updated later this week. So thank you so much. We'll talk to you again on Thursday. Have a good one.